This is Twit. We're starting with a review. We have a review to start with. And so I, I kind of felt bad because this is my this is my Orange Pie RV2. And so this is the this is the reviewing the stuff that Rob talked me into buying segment. Um, and Rob's not here and he bought one too. And I felt bad about that at first until I realized that Rob's RV2 is inevitably still in the box. He's not pulled it out yet. So I don't feel bad anymore. He may or may not ever actually do anything with this, but he's got one too. Um, there's good and there's bad about the RV2. The good is, well, of course, it's ridiculously inexpensive. You can get, well, you can pick one of these up for, I think, $49. Um, there's other good about it. It's got an NVMe slot. In fact, it's got a couple of NVMe slots. The one on the bottom, you can put a full-size NVMe drive in, and it will actually boot off of that. So this thing will boot as it is with no SD card. Um, that's important to me because I've seen so many SD cards die on little devices like this. So being able to get a true NVMe on it, it's just, it's a good thing. Um, this thing will have, it has up to eight, even up to a 16 gigabyte option for system memory. And so that actually gives you enough room to do things on it, like run GitHub runners or do compilation or both, you know, the things that you would want to do, you can actually do with it. Um, this is just about the fastest Risk Five board. It's definitely the fastest sub hundred dollar Risk Five board. I think it's probably the fastest under two hundred dollars as well. If not, it's right in there. It's not as fast as a Raspberry Pi Four. Definitely not as fast fast as the Pi Five. Um, but it is Risk Five. So, like, if you want to be able to compile Risk Five stuff, if you want to. Do development for Risk Five stuff. If you want to do testing with Risk Five stuff, this is the one to go with. Um, and it seems it seems to be you know reasonably good. Um, I will say a couple of things that are weird about it. One is the power supply. So it is it is USB C, and it is a five volt. It is a five volt five amp, which you know, that's their recommended. And you say, oh, that sounds familiar. That's what the Raspberry Pi has except this does not do PD. It's not power delivery. So it's not, it's not a smart power supply. And so there's, there's like only one power supply. I didn't realize this when I bought it. So I bought it without the power supply. I was like, oh, I've got plenty of USB-C power supplies. No, no. You want the, uh, the geek worm, the geek worm 27 watt power supply, because this thing will actually push out five amps at five volts, even without, um, PD negotiation. So that's, Kind of important to be able to make this thing work at its uh, at its full capacity and not have to worry about power brownouts. Um, there is an official Ubuntu image, although I really feel like we got to get some quotation marks in there when we say it's an official Ubuntu image. Um, there are some things missing. From what I can tell, it's not actually doing any video acceleration. Everything there is software, uh, and so I I did a apt update and apt upgrade on it. The good news is that did not brick the board. You get some of these little boards and you do an upgrade and it pulls a new kernel and it's not a compatible kernel and you, you know, you soft brick your board and you get to go reinstall. It did not do that. Um, I did notice something really weird. And that is when I did the updates, all of them got pulled in from HuaweiCloud.com, um, which made me feel a little weird. Just, for reasons um and I, I i don't know this for sure but like so if someone is employed by the us dod you might want to stay away from that <laughs> if you know what i mean um it's probably fine but it's just it was just weird it was a little weird that that's where all of them came from and were hosted um now i don't know huawei may have just a hosting service and so it's not actually affiliated with them but again it was just something i noticed and it it was strange. Um, so it, other, other than that though, it's, uh, it's great. And you know, it, it does have one of the other really neat things is it has the dual gigabit ethernet ports on it. And there is already an official, and this one I think is actually official. Um, there's an official open WRT image that you can go and grab. So you can load open WRT on this, which is going to be, uh, which is going to be really great. Um, one of the other things that I would love to see are some cases, like 3D printable cases for the, the RV2. Um, I don't know if they're out there yet. Hopefully there are some. I've already got some ideas kicking around about what to do with this one and put it in a case. And uh, I think we're going to do some GitHub runners on it. 
be able to do uh, native risk five builds. I think that would be really cool to do. Um, but that's it. It's great. It's a, it's a neat little board. And, you know, so long as like the, the kernel support comes along and all of that, it's going to be really a, it's going to be a pretty interesting development board. So I'm excited to have it and, uh, we're going to put it to use. So if it's got open WRT that can run on it in the two gigabit ethernet ports, is it actually fast enough to route at gigabit speeds? I don't know for sure, but I suspect it is. Good. Okay. Your your old time routers were just like little tiny MIPS cores. This has so much more horsepower than that does. Um, I I would suspect that you can get it to route at uh, a gigabit. Now, if you go to turn on um, like the full on cake or some of those other uh, packet inspection and packet routing, um, not packet route traffic shaping, like some of the more detailed traffic shaping things, you may run into problems. But just for doing NAT routing, I, I don't anticipate there being a problem with it. I bet it could do full gigabit. No, oh, okay. Oh, well, it does? For, it for does somebody have... like me, that's probably what I would... Yeah, I'm not going to be doing heavy inspection. and Right, right. It does have Wi-Fi built in. So you've got the you got the little dongly antenna. I've not actually done anything with that yet, but it is there. Um, and it does actually have a power button, too. Some of the old Raspberry Pis, they were kind of annoying because they didn't have any power circuitry in them. They were just on. And uh, this one apparently actually has a power on and off circuit. So that's kind of cool, too. Nice. I bet I can think of one thing Rob might do with his. What's that? Sell it. No, see, that's not what Rob does. Rob buys these things and they're, they're cool little things. And he gets the box and the box makes him feel good. And he puts it on the side of his desk and he forgets about it. And he never opens it up. Never actually boots Linux on it. That's what Rob does, but he doesn't sell them. He just keeps them to make, it, make himself sell, feel good that he's got the shiny. Has he got toys. a supply, display case he puts them in? I wouldn't doubt it. That sounds like <laughs> Rob. The, 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 shrine, yeah. the shrine of Linux tech in the corner of the office. That's, I, and and I, I do agree. He takes pictures and posts it on his website. <laughs> I do agree the booting from NVMe is really good because, yeah, those SD cards are kind of, I think, in general, viewed as a little more disposable. Mm-hmm. Then, oh, definitely disposable. So yep. that, okay, you throw it in a camera, you do whatever, you load it up. Oh, it goes bad. Throw it away. Grab another one. Mm-hmm. Then you can get them so cheap. Hopefully, you've downloaded the pictures before it goes bad. Hopefully, yeah. <sighs> yes. Yeah. There was a, there was a little bit of setup. Um, there's documentation on how to do it. Uh, I think the documentation was missing a step, if I remember correctly, about actually getting the. Uh, um. Get it, getting the partition set up properly. Um, I had to at least reboot in there to get it to see the new partitions. A couple of little weird things, but I, I got it done. It wasn't too terrible. Um, and did you have to you, reboot two or three times? I think I ended up rebooting it three times to make that happen. Uh, now, if it could like run some- a story I've got about Liam proven rebooting three times. <laughs> yeah. I said, Jeff, go first. Well, I was going to say, if you, uh, if you can run something like Plex on it, and you have the NVMe, you could actually hook a U.2 drive on there. So you could have like a 64 terabyte SSD connected to that as a Plex server. And you could put your entire media collection mm-hmm. on there and serve it from just a little tiny, little tiny form factor. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Hey, it's Leo Laporte. I hope you've enjoyed this little clip from our programming at twit.tv. For more, visit our website, twit.tv, or subscribe in your favorite podcast client. There's also a link somewhere down there. <laughs>